Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. My name is John Cole, and I'm going to be your guest host today. Uh, Mitch Ewan is out on travel doing some important business, I'm sure. But um, I'm here today for our, our Hawaii State of Clean Energy episode. And today we're going to be talking about pressing the boundaries of renewable penetration on Oahu and getting real on our pathway to 100%. Um, my guest here today is a uh, Mark Glick, he's with the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute at the University of Hawaii. He's a specialist on energy policy. Um, welcome, Mark, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks a lot, John. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Great. Um, I, I'll, I'll start off the discussion on why we chose Oahu. I mean, we do have renewable energy goals for the whole state, and I think we're advancing pretty well in that regard. But we decided to concentrate on Oahu because of certain aspects of it. And what, what makes Oahu different from the other islands or, or special or more challenging? Yeah, you know, it's, it's been pretty exciting. As you know, Hawaii has already met its uh, 2030 interim uh, target uh, for a renewable portfolio standard. Um, Hawaii Island, uh, particularly when uh, its geothermal is reinstituted, uh, hopefully sometime early next year, uh, will be well beyond its uh, um, the interim target for 2030 as well. Uh, Maui's right on the cusp. Uh, Oahu uh, is challenged, uh, and there are many reasons for that. But it it is the most populous island. It has the greatest electricity demand. So I think you know those are two of the biggest challenges. Uh, you know, roughly 800 megawatt demand at various times, and that requires a huge amount of renewable energy to make up what we're currently uh, getting from fuel oil, powered thermal generation, and from uh, some coal, which will be phased out, I think, by 2023. So all of that is, I think, um, putting a lot of stress on, on being able to move upwardly uh, fast on these <laughs> renewable goals for a while. Exactly. And unlike some of the other islands, we don't have quite as much land, more right. population, and it's being used for things. So we'll definitely be getting into that a little more. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so the, the utilities have a plan that's been okayed by our regulators, the Public Utility, Utilities Commission. Um, what about those plans? I mean, what... Kind of what do they consist of and, and where are we going as far as types of renewables we're going to be getting on the system and things like that Just if you can describe what that looks like sure you know the, the planning process uh, for um, the Hawaiian electric utilities uh, which uh, cover Maui uh, Hawaii Island and Oahu uh, we're kind of retooled, as you know, as you well know, <laughs> by the Public Utilities Commission a few years ago. Um, it evolved from a typical integrated resource planning process to a power supply improvement plan, a series of other associated plans. So the PSIP, which we like to, re that's our abbreviation for the power supply improvement plan, um, has set forth that. And would this be a good time to bring up some of the graphs? Yeah, can we bring up the first slide? These are, this is just two charts of the utilities plans that were presented to the PUC. And um, the approved plan is a little bit different, but it's close to this. Um, one, well, let, let's yeah, say yeah, that, go ahead. and, and <laughs> I'm, far be it from me to, uh, to correct a former um, a public utilities commissioner, <laughs> even though I was a former energy administrator, uh, basically um, Hawaiian Electric's PSIP was, was accepted. Uh, not officially approved, right? Uh, right. Which, which, and the distinction was that the Public Utilities Commission felt like it was ready to go, but uh, felt like it, it still wasn't quite as specific and as complete as, as necessary because probably some of the things we're going to talk about, right. uh, which are how do you get to these out years really effectively. Um, but clearly, in, in terms of gigawatt hours, which I think these charts are in, um, these are megawatts uh, capacity. Oh, megawatt so capacities. So, um, and it shows the breakdown in terms of um, uh, distributed generation and uh, the amount of energy coming from waste power and wind 
Um, and I think the key distinction between these two particular plans, the post-April plan, which was uh, w one of the pathways that uh, Hawaiian Electric uh, pursued in its uh, PSIP development, and the E3 plan, which favored uh, a, a significant amount more of uh, distributed generation and solar and storage. Um, and I think the storage you can see with the gray uh, components. So there's a massive amount of storage. And as you get towards 2040, uh, that final blip um, from where it spikes uh, is when it goes from 70% renewable energy to 100%. And you can see the vast amount of storage which is required under um, you know, a high PV concentration. Uh, and I guess we're looking at utility scale with the darker golder color and the lighter um, uh, color yellow it's is the distributed rooftop. generation rooftop solar. And, and, and I, you know, the real challenge is, and I think the final plan is actually somewhat uh, mostly tilted towards the E3 plan, but it, um, it definitely favored, I think, the, the solar, solar and storage, and storage right. uh, scenario. So part of the challenge and what led the Hawaiian Natural Energy Institute to uh, want to look at this more deeply is, you know, with our land use requirements, with, uh, with public input that's necessary to site uh, renewable generation, do we really have the um, ability uh, to place on all the potential area enough renewable generation? And particularly, given where the accepted power supply improvement plan is and its heavy concentration of solar and storage, uh, can you find land you know, uh, that, that can actually accommodate this? Um, get it approved and get it installed uh, so that you can meet these targets. This isn't any judgment at all on the PSIP process or the accepted plans at all. It's just simply a matter of looking uh, at different pathways to get you at, at higher levels of renewable. Um, and, you know, I think it will also inform uh, how far and fast you can move towards the um, power supply improvement plan goals. Right. I mean, there's been a lot of talk of, you know, solar and storage will help us get to 100%. Um, and it seems like from this plan and recent activity and the development of new projects that things are kind of going that way. Um, there's one wind farm that's out there and approved and probably will be built, but there's still some people protesting about that. There was a proposed wind farm that may or may not be approved. People talked about offshore wind and then things like geothermal on the other islands. But from a recent RFP the utilities did, which was all solar and storage, there's currently another RFP on the street that people are gonna be bidding on soon or variable renewable generation, which it is anticipated most proposals will be solar with that. And that also is coming with a request for storage. Um, so do you see anything else coming up other than storage and, and PV that might help us get there and diversify the portfolio a bit? Or to me, it seems that's kind of the direction we're gonna be heading, at least in the near term for economic other reasons on this island? Well, clearly the utility <laughs> plan so far, and, and uh, nothing has really altered this, um, as you saw in the last graph, really favor solar and storage. Um, and you're absolutely, absolutely correct. Um, the Kahuku Wind Farm, which, is, uh, which was an approved project, uh, but still is uh, going through, I guess, the final steps of its permitting process. Um, you know, we do have issues with um, our diverse and rare birds uh, and with our um, bat population. Uh, so the indigenous uh, flora and fauna, uh, and particularly in this case, I guess, the fauna, um, is, is something that uh, has raised a lot of concern. So, um, I think that's been uh, the primary issue in the Kuhuku wind farm. Um, the, the other one you mentioned is in the area of, it's called Palihua, but it's above uh, Kahe Power 
flat. And definitely there were a few public meetings and it, I think it demonstrated that there still are a lot of public, uh, a lot of public input that will be received for uh, many types of uh, renewable energy. So I don't think it's a given that you can easily pivot one way or the other. Uh, but it does put, I think, enormous, uh, enormous amount of reliance uh, on the solar and storage elements of mm -hmm. the plan. And in later years, uh, as you may have recalled, there was uh, some biomass or waste elements uh, titled waste in there. And that's essentially uh, waste uh, to energy at mm -hmm. the H power plant and, um, and biomass. Uh, to make up huge amounts of differences. Right, or, or switching fuels to a biofuel, a renewable biofuel. That's right, that's right. and <clears throat> the availability of that, and it certainly doesn't appear at this stage that would it be indigenous or locally produced. Uh, so it means we'd be importing perhaps a green fuel and maybe not even so green a fuel, um, then, uh, and, and replacing that with you know, other imported obviously higher carbon uh, fossil fuels. So again, I think it puts uh, a great deal more reliance. Um, you know, there, there were other um, possibilities that have been discussed in the past. None on their own can solve the problem, uh, but it does appear that it's gonna require uh, a portfolio approach uh, to move forward. And it, it is a little disconcerting to you know, to basically throw all of your eggs in this uh, basket, even though, you know, frankly, there have been other uh, studies and advocates that have made that sound fairly straightforward and pretty right. simple, uh, perhaps a little too simple. Right, right. So it does seem, at least in the near future, many of the utility scale projects are going to be solar, whether solar alone and, and storage with the particular project or utility controlled, but it does seem we're going down that path. And a lot of folks who mention that say that's great, it's getting cheaper and it's going to be cheaper. It's already cheaper than, you know, some oil burning plant, you know, on a cost per kilowatt hour basis. Um, but it certainly comes with a lot of challenges I see, especially building up to the levels we we're talking about um, that a lot of people aren't, you know, pointing out or, or aware of as far as I can tell. So, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's I, kind of the discussion I wanted to have today. Sure, and, <laughs> in, and to be sure, I, I think one of the things that has been uh, somewhat surprising in a very pleasant way has been the great reduction in solar and storage power purchase agreements that have been uh, forged in the last two years. Um, you know, who expected solar and storage to be in the 10 cent per kilowatt range? Uh, I certainly yeah. didn't think it was going to move this low, this rapidly. Um, and so I think there is a strong indication that technology will continue to improve and perhaps uh, bring those prices down even more. We certainly are benefactors of the rapid pace of innovation that's being conducted on the international level. Uh, and certainly in the past, the United States uh, leading the way for many years, China overtaking um, America's lead in terms of uh, investment in renewable energy and re renewable energy innovation. You may recall uh, a few years ago, it seems like centuries ago, but there was a president before the previous, before the current president, <laughs> and um, his Secretary of Energy, um, Ernie Moniz, was an outstanding Secretary of Energy, and he called for, and it was supported by the president, uh, something called Mission Innovation, and that was to double amount of innovation and renewable energy investment, uh, and to do that um, in a 10-year period. Many of the countries of the world are still committed to mission innovation. The United States hasn't fully backed away from it, even though it's backed away from the Paris Accord. So I, I think that we're benefactors of those investments, which are really the driving forces behind these cost curve reductions in wind and solar energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think that that gives us hope that at least um, that strategy will continue to bear good costs. It's, it's I think, the bigger issue, and HNEI has been a real leader in, in uh, analyzing 
the impacts of this. Uh, how can you manage really high rates of renewable, of intermittent energy, particularly solar, and even with storage, firmed right. up with storage, how far can you go with that? Right. right. And, and you're and, a much yeah. greater expert at that than I am. And, and, and one of the things I wanted to talk about is I, I don't think people understand the sheer scale of, you know, the amount of PV that's going to need to be deployed to meet these goals if, if this is a sole path or, you know, pretty exclusive path. Right. I know the RFP that was that Pico recently awarded contracts on for this island was about 130 megawatts. Um, and there's an RFP on the street where people are preparing bids for now. It's almost another 700 megawatts. And that's just enormous in scale. I mean, with our thermal generators, um, we have a peak of around 1,000 megawatts, we'll say, and there's you know a couple hundred extra to cover for generator losses and things like that. But with solar, you need to build much higher than that to cover you know the capacity factor. It's only producing several hours a day, so you need to build a lot more. And if you think about a rough estimate of EV, about two and a half acres per megawatt. So right. that's an awful lot of acres that you know we're going to be seeing under development for solar, and that comes with its own challenges. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, just using that, you know, if you want to get, um, you know, additional 400 megawatts, uh, you're looking at a thousand, uh, you know, plus acres. Uh, and just to give you a sense, uh, Oahu, you know, has about 85,000 acres overall. Uh, and what you have to do is look at, at the acreage that's truly available uh, that uh, through the land use uh, can be permitted. Be, uh, developed in this area, and uh, whether or not it can actually go through a process to be to be approved for that. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to stop you here. We need to go to a quick break, but we'll oh. be right back and continue this discussion. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Winston Welch, host of Out and About. It's a show that we have every other Monday on Think Tech Live here. We explore a variety of topics that are really interesting. We explore organizations, events and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. We've got some amazing guests on here, like all the shows at ThinkTech. So if you want to catch up on stuff, tune into my show every other Monday and other shows here on ThinkTech Live. It's a great place to learn about stuff, to be informed. And uh, if you have some ideas, come on my show. Let's talk about it. See you later. And aloha. Aloha. I'm Stan Osterman, Stan the Energy Man, every Friday here on ThinkTech Hawaii. If you're really interested in finding out what's going on in energy, especially here in Hawaii, but also all the way around the world, and especially if it has to do with hydrogen, look into Stan Energy Man every Friday, 12 o'clock, Think Tech Hawaii. Be there. Aloha. All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm John Cole, your guest host, and Mark Glick from HNEI is here today. And we've been talking about um, getting to 100% renewable penetration on Oahu and challenges and what, what comes along with that. And we were just talking about the sheer volume of PV and what that means, you know, that we'll need to supply our energy demands and what it also means in terms of land use and, you know, how much land that will actually take. Um, so Mark was talking about um, some of that, and we do have some graphics and maps. I don't know if you want to bring that up yet, or? Sure, no, I mean, it's a good time to go into okay. it. I mean, because, you know, we're talking about something that uh, is probably going to require, you know, somewhere from a 20th to a 10th right. of, of all of Oahu's land mass to be able to handle if you were to do it all with the amount of solar and storage that is called for in these plans. In fact, uh, I, I just point out that this, uh, Graphic is showing on the left is the E3 utility plan that we we're talking about, and the other is the post April plan. It doesn't really matter. The post April has a little less solar, and the E3 plan has more. So the dark orange areas are areas that would need to have yeah. solar on them in order to it's meet order the to, requirement. Yeah, if you go, if you follow that plan, which essentially is one electric plan for now, um, you're going to have to fill all of those areas. Those are basically, and let me, do you mind if I uh, sort of 
uh, take a step back. And these maps are, um, we were uh, very, very gracious that um, that Jason Lee and his team um, of outstanding researchers at the Laboratory of Advanced Visualization Applications, LAVA, really great name for that, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, just several do doors down from our, uh, our building. Um, Jason is one of the top uh, designers in the world of, of uh, these advanced visualization environments. And when I was energy administrator, I had really thought that um, in, to help our energy planning and to help the utilities and to help the public and help decision makers make better decisions, you had to translate all these data sets, all these heavy da technical data sets into images. And so um, we applied for a grant with the Department of Energy on something called the Hawaii Advanced Visualization Energy Nexus <laughs> Haven. I don't know who came up with that acronym, but in, anyway, uh, they did, and we won that grant, and we came up with uh, one of the most advanced projects in the United States to be able to place this data, uh, set it up in a geographical way, and so these maps that you're looking at are products of that project. And so they did a, a picture, they loaded all the data essentially uh, from the power supply improvement plan and how far you had to go. And under the, as, as John had mentioned, under the E3 plan, which is on the left, uh, you really have to fill out that much land uh, to meet the solar uh, priorities. Because the plan on the right, this post-April plan, has more offshore wind and it has more uh, other stuff, uh, other renewable energy uh, sources. It requires less um, solar, but it's not the operable plan today. But if you look at that map and you, you, know, you see that uh, area to the left, on the far left, that huge uh, circle in the middle, you know, that, that's covering almost all of Why not? Yeah. Uh, if yeah. I could point out, a lot of the white blank space you see there is, you know, the, the ranges, the Y9 yeah, range that's, and that's Kowal right. range, with a lot of steep land, so that's pretty much unavailable. Yeah, so. Mokula'ia, completely covered, yeah. um, you know, there's, and, and we'll take a look at some other maps, yeah. we'll show some layers. The layers, you know, <laughs> basically who are the owners of this property, you know, right. who, who, is the, who are the people <laughs> that you would, would actually have to give you permission to place these renewable right. energy uh, elements there. And, and again, the purpose of this is to get us a clear sense of uh, staging and phasing of these uh, projects and to give us, a, I think, a clear sense of what we need to do to get ready uh, to get these mm -hmm. things underway and to maybe give us some caution that in the event that some of these don't appear to be as realistic as we'd hoped, uh, we need to come up with other options. So again, this is you know meant to provide I think uh, some guidance, but perhaps even a, a reality check down the road. Right, and to help under people understand the magnitude of, of our needs and you know this transition. That's right. Um, and let's just show one of the other sl slides. I think it's slide um, five. Okay. Um, and just one time, I wanted to add the layer. The yellow on this map is you know land that's zoned for either residential or commercial. So yeah. a lot of that overlaps with what you're seeing as areas where solar could be built. So, I mean, that's just one of the layers. There's agricultural layers, different land ownership, like Mark had said. So there's a lot of different challenges that will come with, you know, citing uh, that, that amount of photovoltaic utility scale, as well as, you know, other challenges with doing that, including getting the power to where it's needed. I mean, a lot of these are kind of out in the country and a lot of the power is needed in town, so it may require things like transmission upgrades and things like that. Well, you know, what we decided to do, and uh, you know, I have to credit uh, Dr. Rick Rochelo, who's the director of HNEI, uh, for his willingness to put resources towards uh, this effort. And uh, what he's asked me to do is come up with a project plan uh, which involves identifying uh, chief stakeholders that should be involved, obviously utilities uh, and um, 
you know, the grid operator uh, <laughs> clearly has to be involved. And they're very interested in this because they want to get a better handle on uh, how to effectively carry out their plans and so on. Uh, obviously, there are other players that uh, will understand the uh, issues of uh, grid interconnection, but also land use and, uh, and, and the fair and equitable use of the land for this purpose. Uh, we want to bring those players together to help us analyze. Uh, we want to bring in some actors. Um, again, we haven't gone through this process yet, so I won't bring up names, but there are companies that have done really great work with uh, GIS. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been heavily involved with some of them in terms of their ability to uh, create layers uh, to, to look at the, um, you know, the hosting capacity uh, for the distributed generation um, and to reflect all of those elements uh, and to try to do that as rapidly as we can. I mean, maybe do that over the next uh, 12 months. Right. Um, and so we're really committed to do that. I, I pretty much have, I think, through the next several months, uh, develop that plan and, and get that process underway. That's great. Thank you. We've only got a couple minutes left, so really? time is really flown. <laughs> For I me, can. anyway. I don't right. know if you're enjoying this as much as I am. Oh, it's been great. <laughs> um, but uh, I did want to ask, I mean, in addition to the transmission <laughs> and actual land availability, there's also maybe community concerns. We've seen some of that starting to pop up with wind farms and things like that. Solar yeah. is different, but it's going to be a lot of land that it needs. So you anticipate some of those issues be forefront as well? Well, it wouldn't be uh, project <laughs> development if, if you didn't have some of that. Uh, you know, we take all of that seriously. And, uh, you know, I, I've listened to uh, Consumer Advocate and others on the conversation and other, tele you know, other uh, radio and television shows. Uh, all very seriously uh, taking into consideration uh, community input. And we need to do that. Um, the idea is that this, to serve all of us and to make the state much greater. So uh, we need to look at all these things very carefully uh, and make sure that they are appropriate and that they meet the intent of our environmental review laws and, <laughs> and all of that. Okay, well. I guess we're about out of time, so I want to thank you very much, Mr. Glick, for joining <laughs> me here on uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy today. Well, thanks so much. It's been an honor uh, <laughs> sharing this uh, opportunity with you and all the great work you've done as well. I continue to do at HNEI as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.